from one Super Bowl champion to another. Drew Brees weighs in on Tom Brady's suspension and has some harsh words for Commissioner Goodell. The draft is just two days away. Which new coach needs to pick a winner in the first round? We'll tell you who is feeling the pressure. And has Chris Paul's injury shut the Clippers' championship window? This is SI Now. Hey there, welcome to SI Now. It is Tuesday, April 26th, and I'm Maggie Gray. Our first guest is a Super Bowl champion and Super Bowl MVP. He's an all-pro who's been selected to nine Pro Bowls and has also been awarded the Walter Payton Man of the Year. Saints quarterback Drew Brees is good enough to join us from Chicago in the 120 Sports Studios. Uh, Drew, are you sticking around in Chicago for the draft? No, I'm not. I'll be back in New Orleans training with the team, but certainly be tuning in. Of course, we know that quarterbacks are expected to go one and two for the second straight year. We know that quarterback is really important, perhaps the most important position on the field. But do you feel like even in your 15 going on 16 seasons, having a franchise quarterback is now even more coveted than when you entered the league? Yeah, yeah, obviously the game has evolved. Um, I'd say the thing that uh, I feel like I've I've seen over the last you know five to ten years, especially, is that you know quarterbacks are coming in the league so much uh, more well prepared um, to you know step into that starting role than ever before, and you know call it the uh, um, just the crossover of, of coaches going from NFL to pro, and so you know you've got certain systems that would carry over to both, defenses that carry over to both. Once you decide who your franchise quarterback is, you completely tailor the offense around that player. You put him in the best position to succeed, and you draft according to that. You get skill position players according to that, linemen according to that. I mean, everything just gets customized to um, your quarterback and his skill set. And so, yeah, if you if you, if you – look at it that way, then then absolutely choosing who your quarterback is going to be really dictates so much about your football team. Yeah, we know that the complexion of the Saints defense had a chance to change earlier uh, last week, or at least that was the report when Josh Norman unexpectedly became a free agent. And from what we heard, you offered to restructure your contract. Is Norman that much of a difference maker? Um, you know what, I've uh, obviously played against Josh Norman for the last four years in Carolina. Um, if he's not going to be on our team, I'm kind of glad he's out of the division. <laughs> um, but uh, he's a great player, you know, watched him grow, watched him mature, and obviously he had a phenomenal year last year. Um, and, yeah, he, he could be a difference maker. And, and, listen, those decisions are not mine, um, you know, when it comes to the draft, when it comes to free agency. Certainly if I'm asked, I'll give my input. Um, you know, based upon my experience with a guy um, or knowledge of. But, uh, you know, yeah, there's there's plenty of guys out there that, that I'd say, man, these guys are difference makers. These guys can help us get better. And whatever it help, whatever I can do to help our team uh, get better and be put in the best position to succeed and win and win championships, that's what I want to do. You, well, your teammates really – took on the commissioner during Bounty Gate, and, and Brady has been taking on the commissioner for more than almost 20 months at this point. Your teammates were exonerated in Bounty Gate. Does it really underscore that perhaps the commissioner has too much power when it comes to punishing players? I mean, you saw this up close and personal. Uh, well, I, I, I think we would all agree he definitely has too much power, um, that he is basically judge, jury, executioner when it comes to all league discipline. And um, I, I mean, listen, I, I would I'm not going to trust any league um, led investigation when it comes to anything, <laughs> um, because it's it's uh, it's not transparent um, at times. You know, I, I feel like there's a desired conclusion or agenda um, that they have in mind. And that is, um, you know, prevents maybe the absolute truth from being told or the absolute facts from being presented. And at the end of the day, you know, we as the public, we as players don't ever really get to see, um, to see that. We never get to see those facts, those truths, those, you know, those things. So that's the unfortunate part about this whole 
thing is in regards to Brady in particular, I, I think we all thought this was a dead issue, you know, and, and then all of a sudden it, it's the announcement is made a day or two ago that, you know, his, his suspension has basically been upheld or the decision that Goodell has the authority to suspend him for four games has been, you know, upheld. So listen, it, it is what it is. I, I really don't know the inner workings of, of how that's been going over the last year. Um, I thought, I think we all thought it would, it had passed. And, and here it is again. And so I'm sure we'll learn more about it over the next few weeks. But I think certainly there should be um, more of a third party independent um, involvement when it comes to, uh, you know, suspensions and some of the things that have transpired over the last few years in regards to the bounty accusations, which were found to be, uh, in most cases, completely false. And yet it affects the um, uh, the perception as to what was going on with our organization and with certain players and with certain coaches that have very high character, very high integrity, and yet that was challenged and that was, um, unfortunately, they were falsely accused in many cases. Um, and yet there's no apology that ever comes from that. There's no, well, we could have handled things differently. It's, you know, very much everything's kind of happening behind closed doors and this is the way it is and you just have to accept it. So. There's nothing we can really do about it. We're just going to play the game, try to win championships, um, try to do it the right way, and hopefully people will notice. Well, the next collective bargaining agreement will be up for discussion in the year 2020. Maybe some things can change then in terms of Roger Goodell's role as judge, jury, and executioner. Um, Drew, before I let you go, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, we know that the way that teams are trying to gain an edge lately is by getting the most sleep that they possibly can. Seems like a little <laughs> bit of a left turn, but uh, how many hours of sleep would you say you get a night? Uh, I'm probably seven to seven and a half hours of sleep a night. But, you know, honestly, it's not what, 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 what I've come to realize, and this is so important, is it's not the amount of time, but it's the quality of sleep. And, and do I need quality sleep? Yes, I do, absolutely. Am I a hot sleeper? Yes, I do, absolutely. I, yes, I am. And so this mattress, I feel like it's been developed and named after me. So I appreciate that, Temple P, that you named the Temple Breeze mattress after me. I get to do, you know, a, a cool set of digital video series with my center, Max Unger, where basically I interrupt him at 3 a.m. to tell him that he needs to sleep on this new Temple Breeze mattress with cooling technology because I know he's a big guy and he's a hot sleeper and I need him to be well rested, you know, for the game the next day. And so we had fun with that. We're going to be posting those uh, videos on social media today. And uh, people can also go to youtube.com slash Tempur-Pedic beds to view them as well. But they're, uh, they're fun. Drew Brees, we are flat out of time. But Drew, thank you so much for uh, answering our wide range of questions for today. And um, good luck to the Saints holding that number 12 pick in the draft. And hopefully we'll catch up with you again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Coming up, we'll take a look at SI's final mocked draft. Who is your team taking? We'll tell you next. SI Now will be right back. Welcome back to SI Now. Drum roll, please. The final NFL mock draft is here. Our own Chris Burke did 10 editions of the mock, including a very special Game of Thrones mock draft, which we all thoroughly enjoyed. And Chris joins me now. All right, we're two days away from draft day. We believe now that Jared Goff is going to go number one to the Rams. For many mocks, though, Chris, you had Carson Wentz as that top quarterback. Are the Rams making a mistake? You don't want to talk about the Game of Thrones anymore? <laughs> I don't want to spoil right, it for the people out there okay, who haven't seen it. Uh, I think Jared Goff is the best quarterback in this class. So I think that, that from that perspective, it's not a mistake at all. I think that's the right move to go with Goff one. Uh, it was kind of 50-50. I think it was hard to really read the Rams' hand. I think they wanted it that way. The Eagles moving up kind of hammered it home because I think that's who they want. I think they want Carson Wentz at two. So knowing that they're at two, they have to feel pretty comfortable, even though Los Angeles hasn't given away what they're doing. I think they're pretty comfortable that Wentz will be there. So uh, Goff at one, and I think that's the right guy. The Rams want to compete. Goff's more ready to step in this year. 
then Carson Wentz. Okay, with all this quarterback talk, we've really lost sight of the third overall pick in the draft. That's by the Chargers. You think they're going to take DeForest Bruckner from Oregon, the pass rusher, as opposed to Joey Bosa. Why Bruckner? I think it's a I think I think he's a better fit for the Chargers, first of all. And you know, Joey Bosa is someone that we're not really sure whether he's gonna be a three four outside linebacker, four three defensive end. Buckner's definitely a three four guy, gives you that big presence up front up front, uh, tall, long plays with some power. So I really like the fit there. I think he's a top 10 guy in this class. And if they want to get better uh, as a team, I think they need to get better along the line. So that's an obvious pick for them. Another team that needs some major defensive help is the New Orleans Saints. We were just talking with their quarterback, Drew Brees. Uh, you have Noah Spence filling a big gap for them. What can he give to New Orleans? Why do you like that as a fit? Well, Noah Spence is interesting because he's one of those quote unquote red, red flag guys. Yeah, you know, he has should you the, put him in New Orleans? Well. <laughs> Should you put anyone in New Orleans? <laughs> Good point. And that, that's the argument. Uh, I mean, I think the reason I like him there is because they need more help off the edge, and he's one of the most dynamic edge rushers in this draft. They have Hulohi Kikaha they picked last year. Uh, they talked about moving him maybe to defensive end. He's probably better off rushing from an outside linebacker spot. Don't know if he has that strength to play defensive end. And uh, Spence is someone that, again, in that Bosa range, is he a 4-3 end? Is he a 3-4 outside linebacker? I think he's better at end in a 4-3, which is where the Saints want to be. I think he'll get them some pressure on the quarterback. And uh, like you said, they need defense. So uh, I've had the, them going offense because that's what they do a lot. But I like giving them a defensive playmaker. Yeah, we should mention those red flags. He was at Ohio State, got kicked out for two drug-related offenses, landed in junior college or a lower-level college. Okay, new coaches. We see a lot of new regimes. Draft day can be one of the biggest tests for not only coaches but new front offices. Is there some team that's feeling a lot of pressure to really nail this first round draft pick and set up their future? Well, I think the two that are linked together, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and you look at San Francisco, they bring in Chip Kelly. They have to sort of restructure that roster to what Chip Kelly wants, and that's tough. We saw how hard it was in Philadelphia. So even if you're giving them two, three years, uh, you want to get off on the right foot. So I think it's important for them. And then on Philadelphia's side, they basically gave up the rest of this draft and their 2017 draft to go up and get a quarterback. So they have to make sure Carson Wentz is the right guy. And then beyond that, uh, when they are on the clock, I think they've got to find guys that are going to contribute relatively soon. You can't really uh, throw those picks away because you only have a handful of them. Do you see Sam Bradford, who is publicly now, or his agents have, asked for a trade? Do you see him getting dealt on Thursday night? I think it'll happen if it happens. I think it's more likely to happen after the draft after teams that need quarterbacks see if they can get one okay. uh, it, with his contract. It's really hard to see him moving right now. Give us a bold prediction for Thursday night, Chris. What's going to shake things up? I'll go back to the quarterbacks. <laughs> I think Cleveland passes on a quarterback in the top 10. I know there's been some talk about Paxton Lynch there after they traded down. Uh, I think they pass on a quarterback there and then come back up into round one late, trade up from round two and grab if Lynch is there, if Connor Cook's there, one of those two guys to be there, uh, hopefully for them, the future franchise quarterback. Another Cleveland quarterback hey. is the bold <laughs> prediction from Chris Burke. Why not, right? They've done it many, many times before. Chris, thank you. Appreciate sure. it. Okay. Up next, how will the Clippers regroup after losing Chris Paul for the rest of the season? We're talking hoops next. There's more SI now right after this. Now, now we'll really see what the Clippers are made of with their floor general Chris Paul now out for the playoffs with a broken hand. Can the Clippers absorb that huge loss and continue their run through the postseason? SI writer Ben Golliver is here to answer that question and much more. Okay, Ben, the Blazers, they battled back to tie the series at 2-2, but now Chris Paul is out. What is the likelihood that L.A. can advance to the next round without Paul? Maggie, this is a really dire situation. I don't want to try to be over dramatic about it, but the Clippers roster was top heavy all season long. We know Doc Rivers has been scrambling his roster, trying to find anybody to support his star players, right? Well, look at those stars right now. You've got Chris Paul, you know, serious hand injury, likely done for the series um, and more. Blake Griffin, 50-50 for the next game because of an ongoing leg injury that's uh, bothered him since Christmas. 
He hasn't looked right at all in this first round series against the Blazers. J.J. Redick also looks out of sync dealing with a heel issue. And then DeAndre Jordan's airballing free throws uh, during, you know, really a very important game four uh, on Monday night. So all the stars really are kind of falling apart simultaneously for the Clippers. That's a bad recipe. You want to be kind of cresting momentum wise right now. And I think, unfortunately, they're kind of falling apart. If they don't win game five at home, uh, that's going to be a very, very difficult game six up in the Moda Center. Because remember, the Blazers have only advanced out of the first round once since 2000. So the crowd's just going to be nuts up there if they get a uh, chance to do it again. Okay, we know the Clippers are operating under a very condensed timeline. They are feeling the urgency to win a title. Now with these injuries, they do not look like a championship caliber team. Do you expect major changes coming to L.A. this offseason? It's been a whirlwind, Maggie. I mean, think about the 24 hours for the Clippers. As soon as Steph Curry goes down, all of a sudden their hopes were raised probably more than at any point in the last, say, two or three years. And they seemed like they were going to have, uh, you know, potentially a chance to make the Western Conference Finals and beyond uh, because obviously Chris Paul was going to be in position to play the Warriors uh, without their all-star point guard, their MVP point guard. And now it's almost exactly the reverse uh, the Clippers are kind of straggling to put together a rotation and a roster. Doc Rivers wouldn't even commit to who he's going to start in Game 5, said there could be multiple changes. Uh, and then, be, you know, bigger picture beyond that, uh, if they do go out here in the first round, I mean, that puts them as one of the d biggest disappointments in the entire NBA, right alongside teams like uh, Houston and, and maybe the Chicago Bulls who didn't make the playoffs. So that's not good. I mean, that's probably a recipe for a big-time shakeup this offseason. And I think it's going to really put a lot of heat, not only on Chris Paul, who can't be blamed for his own injury, but really more on Blake Griffin because he had a disastrous season, not only the injury at Christmas, uh, but the off-court incident with the punch, not being able to get right in time for the playoffs, uh, really being a non-factor in this series. All of those things are going to put a lot of scrutiny on Blake Griffin. And he's not a guy who's dealt with a ton of that so far during his career. All right, Ben. We talk about the Warriors. They're going to miss Steph Curry, we think, out for two weeks, although it looks like they may get him back. If we expect Golden State to get by Houston, who is the tougher matchup for them potentially in the next round? Would it be a depleted Clippers team or a Blazers team that still would need to close this thing out in the first round? I, I would lean the Blazers uh, just because the health factor, they're much healthier uh, and they are playing better. You know, they really struggled out of the gate in the first round, games one and games two. They, and they looked like they had nerves. Damian Lillard couldn't get it going against Chris Paul. But they turned around in game three. I mean, give Damian Lillard a lot of credit. Before that game, I said he had to step up if this was going to be a series. And he really did. Uh, and everybody else kind of followed in his lead in game four. You had some supporting guys like uh, Al Farouk Aminu, who's not known as a shooter. Uh, he can't miss practically in game four. And he's been... Uh, throwing up bricks all season long. So they've got a little bit of positive momentum going right now. Uh, it's going to be very tough for them to win on the road. I mean, they're not a very good road team. So even against a depleted Clippers team, they still have some work yet to do. Uh, but they're going to go, if they do make the second round, they enter it totally fearless uh, with nothing to lose. And if you're the Warriors, uh, you know, that's a dangerous opponent. Uh, you know, they've got a strong home court advantage up in Portland, like I mentioned earlier. That also makes them a little bit feisty. I think if Golden State could choose, they would rather pick a Clippers team that's trying to juggle its rotation and figure out how to replace a Chris Paul than deal with a Blazers team that's more cohesive and kind of rolling right now. Okay. Uh, moments ago, it was announced that Steve Kerr was named NBA Coach of the Year. Now, we're taking nothing away from Kerr, but he did miss the first 43 games of the season as he was recovering from back surgery. Should he have been given that honor? I actually thought that was one of the best reasons to vote for him because when I look at coaches, I look at establishing cultures, establishing offensive systems and defensive systems uh, that can withstand any type of adversity. And you don't usually think that adversity is going to be the health of the coach himself. But in this case, that's exactly what happened. And look at the culture and the framework that Kerr created in his first year and how well it carried over into his second year. And also, frankly, it was a coaching decision to tab a guy like Luke Walton to step into his shoes. Uh, Kerr had to make that call. It worked out beautifully, and Luke Walton really thrived uh, in that role, getting Golden State off to that hot, hot start in Kerr's absence. And now he's one of the top candidates on the market, and I'm sure Lakers fans would kill to have him as their coach. Uh, so to me, you really got to give Kerr a lot of credit for 
not only the work that he did uh, in keeping everything together down the stretch as they chased 73 wins, but also the strength of his culture uh, that really withstood his own absence. To me, that's why he was coach of the year. You don't see a team like this uh, you know, every year come along. There's always going to be those great upstart, overachieving type stories. We saw a number of those, whether it was Charlotte, Portland, Toronto this season. Uh, to me, the greatness of Golden State demanded this award for Steve Kerr, even if he missed some time. Although I'm curious now, how is Steve Kerr going to manage this team in the next two weeks without Steph Curry? That could be a true test. Ben Golliver. Ben, thank you so much. We'll check in with you again soon. All right, that's going to do it for today's episode of SI Now. We'll be back on Wednesday at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time with L.A. Rams running back Todd Gurley. But until then, you can keep up with all the latest sports news on SI.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SI Now Live. Okay, don't go anywhere because SI.com has a special treat in store for you. It's Boomer Esiason, Chris Collinsworth, Phil Sims, and Howie Long. They are the experts network and we're proud to present their NFL draft special right now.